Good morning, City Light. All right, that's it. I am excited, as always, to dig into God's Word with you this morning. Like Tyler said, we are continuing our walk through the book of Joshua. If you've been with us the last several weeks, you know that Joshua is the account of all the great works that God did to give his people a place in the land that he promised them. God's work to give his people a place in the land that he promised them. And as the book has unfolded, we're kind of confronted with the question, who exactly are God's people? If God is giving his people a place in the promised land, who is in and who is out, right? I think that question, who exactly is part of God's people, is a question that we still ask today, isn't it? Like, who are God's people now? Are they the people that sin the least or know the most Bible verses or have the best church Sunday morning attendance or is it something else? Who exactly are God's people? people. Well, friends, I think the answer matters. We know it matters in the book of Joshua because in Joshua, God's people are promised a place with him in the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and God dwells there with them. If you're part of God's people, you get all of that, but if you're not, you get kicked out and destroyed, right? And so the answer mattered for the people of Joshua's day, and frankly, friends, I think it matters just as much for us in our day. Because the Bible tells us that God's people are promised life with Him now and paradise in heaven with Him for eternity. And those who aren't part of God's people are uh, condemned to a life of separation from God for eternity in hell. How's that for a lighthearted start to the message this morning, okay? Look, I'm not trying to be dramatic here, but I do want you to know the truth about what the Bible says. The answer to the question, who exactly are God's people, it matters. And I think Joshua 9 helps us sort out the answer. And so let's get to it. Let's dive in. In the book of Joshua, as a whole, we might, as we start out, think that the answer to that question is kind of obvious and easy. For example, we read this in Joshua chapter 3. It says, And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. All the sites, the hard names I made Tyler read this morning. <laughs> Sometimes I love picking out the scripture reading text. Uh, those verses make it pretty clear. Who's on God's side and who isn't, right? There's the people of Israel. God is talking to them. He's making promises to them. He promises to live among them and to drive out their enemies. So who are the people of God? The Israelites. Who are not the people of God? It's all those other guys. The Canaanites and Amorites and Hittites and Hivites and Jebusites and Girgashites and all those guys. So that's the clean, concise easy, clear answer from the early chapters in the book of Joshua. But as the book unfolds, our, challenge, our categories get challenged. We begin to wonder, are the lines drawn that clearly? Have we put them in the right place? Is that accurate? Is that how we determine who God's people are? Simply by where they're from. Well, I think Joshua challenges our categories. You might know what I'm talking about. Have you ever had your categories challenged? I was thinking about this, and I remembered back in elementary school, uh, I remember coming home from school one day sort of irritated because at recess there were girls who just bothered me the whole time. And I thought that meant that they were mean and annoying and didn't like me. And I, so I was talking to my mom, telling the whole story, laying out what happened at recess, and she sat me down and said, actually, Eric, that's what girls do when they do like you. And I, 
thought, that's crazy. I didn't understand it then. I still kind of don't understand it now. It challenged all my categories. Why would the world work like that, right? Or like I've got a brother who uh, made a commute from Des Moines to Ames, Iowa every day for work. And he would complain often about other drivers on his commute. People are terrible at driving. And one day he realized, I complain about my commute more than other people complain about theirs. Do I have a different experience? What's going on here? The common denominator of all my complaining stories is me. Maybe that means I'm the bad driver. He just had his mind blown. His, his categories were challenged. Maybe I need to think differently about the world around me and what I see. Have you ever had something like that happen? Well, I think that's what we see happening as the book of Joshua unfolds. See, at the beginning, we think that it's the people of Israel that God has chosen to live in the promised land, and he's going to kick everybody else out. And generally, that's true. we got to be careful about how we draw the lines, because as the book unfolds, we encounter stories that challenge those categories. For example, we meet Rahab. She is a prostitute and a Canaanite, not an Israelite. And so if our categories are right, that the people of Israel are in as God's people and everybody else is out, if our categories are right, Rahab ought to be out. But we read the Bible and that's not what happens. Rahab gets saved. She's in. In fact, the Bible says, but Rahab, the prostitute, and her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute, was in. And she lived in God's land with God's people. That challenges our categories. What's going on? And then we keep turning the pages. The story keeps unfolding. We meet a man named Achan. He's an Israelite man. He's a soldier in the Lord's army who has just been part of the destruction of Rahab's hometown, Jericho. And we would think if our categories are right and Israel is in and everybody else is out, this Israelite soldier, he ought to be in. But we read the Bible and that's not what happens. Uh, Achan stole some of the plunder or the treasure from the city of Jericho. He stole it away from God and he got stoned. He's out. He experienced the same destruction that all the peoples of the land experience. It challenges our categories. And so I don't know about you, but as I read through the book of Joshua, I begin to think maybe my categories aren't quite right. Maybe this is like the day the girls were bothering me on the playground and my mom had to show me some deeper truths going on, right? I need a deeper understanding of what's happening. I think Joshua 9 gives us another piece of the puzzle. It helps us understand who God's people are and aren't, who gets saved, who gets destroyed, who is in and who is out. And friends, I think we'll see that the answer is a whole lot less about where you're from and a whole lot more about who you follow. Who are God's people? I think the answer is a whole lot less about where you're from and a whole lot more about who you follow. Now, let me show that to you in the Bible. Here's what's going on. There is a city in the promised land called Gibeon. It is five miles or so northwest of Jerusalem, about 15 or 16 miles from the place where the people of Israel have set up camp at Gilgal. Now, 15 or 16 miles, that's not very far away. These these Gibeonites are in close proximity to the people of God. They're just down the road. They're neighbors. Now, that matters Because as the people of God have entered the promised land and they're continuing their move of conquest throughout the promised land, destroying and driving out all the people who've rejected God and embraced their sin, 
that means being uh, just down the road, the Gibeonites are early in the season. All right, they're going to be, they're going to encounter the Israelites right away, faster than some of the other people in the land. So if the conquest of the promised land is like a college football season, this would be an early game, okay? But not only is it an early game, it's going to be one of the toughest games of the year because these guys are strong. They're mighty. They're battle-hardened and battle-ready. Engaging Gibeon early in the season would be a whole lot more like engaging Iowa State, top 10 team, than Nebraska. Okay, I'm just saying, that's, that's what we got going on. Okay, look at what the Bible says about Gibeon, okay? Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities. And it was greater than Ai, one of the cities that God's people had just destroyed. And all its men were warriors. So when you think Gibeon, you think a great city full of warriors, full of people who are ready to win the fight, conquer the opponent, defend their home ground. This is a city of warriors. And with that in mind, let's look again at how Joshua chapter 9 begins. Okay, this is what Tyler read for you earlier. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the low land all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this, what had just happened to Ai, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. So here's the scene. Joshua and the people of Israel have just demolished Jericho and Ai. And word of those battles and what happened there is spreading throughout the promised land. And it's going out everywhere to the hills and the valleys, from the river on the east all the way to the coast. Everyone has heard about what God is doing, how he destroyed the cities and killed the kings. And so all the kings of the promised land make a plan. We're going to join up together. We're going to have a united front. And we're going to go against Joshua and Israel and their God as one. And so there's this group of allies taking shape to fight against God and his people. And that kind of reinforces our early categories, right? It's easy to see who's on God's side and who's standing against him. But again, our categories are challenged because here's what verse 3 says. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning. So, Our great city of warriors, they hear what God is doing, and rather than join in with the uh, group of other kings who are going to stand against God, they act with cunning. They devise a different strategy for engaging with Israel. Rather than waiting for that fight to come to them, they determine to pursue Israel and get a covenant with them no matter what it takes. And I think that difference and why they did it and how it plays out is going to clarify our categories of who God's people are and who they aren't. It's going to help us um, see what God is doing here. So let's look at why the Gibeonites did not join the allied kings against God. I'm going to read a few passages for you from Joshua chapter 9. I want you to look and listen for the common thread that weaves throughout them, okay? Here's number one, verse three, reads like this. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning. First clue. Second clue, uh, this is verse 9b. For we, that's the Gibeonites, have heard a report of the Lord and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan. One more clue, number three, this is verse 24. 
It reads, It was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. All right. Why did the Gibeonites refuse to stand against God? Because they'd heard what happened to everyone who tried to tried it, right? They had heard what God was doing. They heard how God had set his people free from the mighty Egyptians who'd enslaved them for centuries. They'd heard what God had done to take his people from Egypt to the promised land and how they'd conquered all the kings who tried to stand in their way. They'd heard that the people of God had crossed over into the promised land and the first two cities that they encountered got destroyed. Jericho and Ai and and then they heard that God had promised to give all the land to his people and by God's power they were taking it they heard what God had done and they responded and that response saved their city friends the Bible is telling us that hearing matters do you see it over and over and over, why did the Gibeonites turn to God instead of from God? They heard what God had done. Friends, I think that hearing still matters today. The Bible says it does. Let me read to you from the book of Romans. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That tells us something about who God's people are. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Friends, hearing is a critical link in that chain. Lives are changed when people hear and respond. It's why we talk about Jesus all the time around here. It's why we meet together three times every Sunday morning. It's why our city groups meet every week. It's why we eagerly look for opportunities to serve and engage in our city because we never want to miss a chance for someone in our lives to hear the good news about Jesus. Are you with me? And so friends, can I encourage you today, God has given you a voice. God has given you a voice, and it might be your voice that God uses for someone to hear his good news and respond in faith. It, hearing matters. He's given us voices so that the world might hear what he is doing, what he has done, and respond in faith. This story is our story, right? Right? Hearing matters. Let's use our voices so that others around hear the name of Jesus. Got it? Okay, back to Joshua. Our great city of warriors, the Gibeonites, they heard about God's powerful works and they responded. They knew what God had said and done and they feared what would happen if they stood against him. And so they decide we're going to do whatever it takes to follow him. The Bible says they act with cunning. As that plays out, here's what we see. This great city of warriors, all the men in the city, warrior, they trade in their battle armor for raggedy, torn up old clothes. They trade in their war horses for donkeys. They trade in their battle rations for stale, crumbly, old bread. And they pack their lunches, hop on their donkeys, and they make their way to Israel 15 miles down the road. Now, this is tricky. They're trying to look like they're from far away, that they've made a long journey, even though they've only traveled a few miles. Why? Why that cunning act? Why play that trick? Well, it seems like the Gibeonites have done their homework. Not only have they heard what God has done, they must have heard what God has said. 
Because you see, God gave different instructions to his people about how to engage the people in the promised land and how to engage people who are far off from the promised land. From those that they're close to, that are in the land that God's giving them, and those that they're far from around the, God, the land that God's giving them. Let me read to you from Deuteronomy God's instructions, what God said. Here's Deuteronomy chapter 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, that's the promised land where God's people are right now, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Gibeonites were Hivites, so this is the people of Gibeon, and uh, the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Eric translation, God says, go Cobra Kai on those folks, okay? Strike first, strike hard, no mercy. But God says something different about the people who are far off from the land. Look at what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 20. When you draw near to a city to fight against it, Offer terms of peace to it. And if it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not cities of the nations here. So you see the difference. If they're in the land, no mercy, destruction. If they're far from you, offer peace. Make a covenant. The Gibeonites must have not just heard what God was doing, but heard what God had said, and they see an open door. They pretend to be from far, far away and think maybe if we can trick Israel, then they'll make peace with us. They're trying to rickroll God's people, okay? And their plan works. They dress up like they just made a long journey, And they make the short trek to Israel. They play their trick. Look, look at our worn out clothes and our old bread. This was in the oven when we left and look at it now. And they play their trick and the people of Israel bought it hook, line, and sinker. Bible says, so the men of Israel took some of their provisions but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. The trick was so convincing that the people, the leaders of Israel, made the covenant without even a short prayer. Feels to me like the Gibeonites did one of those infomercials, like for OxyClean, where they're like, hey, our soap, it's going to take out any stain you can handle. Stains, grass stains, wine stains, dirt stains. It can be on your shirt, in your car, on your carpet, anywhere, anytime. Our soap's going to take it out. And then you see that little cartoon of the soap bubbles that reach all the way down into the carpet fibers and grab the dirt and just float it out, right? And they're like, call this 800 number now. You've never had soap like this. We got to seal this deal. And so you call the 800 number and you get the box of soap. And guess what? It works just like any other soap you've ever had right they're swindlers they play a trick and that's what the Gibeonites are doing here they come to the people of Israel and they're like hey look at our raggedy clothes and our sandals are all worn out and our donkeys are tired and our food is stale and we've made this long long journey we want to make peace with you because we heard your God is incredible sign on the dotted line here it is and the people of God look at all the evidence that's there and without even a prayer they sign on the dotted line it's a mistake The people of God did not listen to God. They made a covenant with people that they should not have made a covenant with. But the Gibeonites got their peace. They got their covenant. Though it was a trick, they wanted a covenant with God's people at whatever cost they could find it. And so they they tricked the people of Israel and they got their peace. Friends, I think we can learn something from the Gibeonites here. They heard what God had done, and in fear of God, they turned to God. Let me say that again, because it's it's kind of counterintuitive. The people of Gibeon heard what God had done, and in fear of God, they turned to God. Now that's fascinating, because when we talk about the fear of God, uh, 
I think our culture says fear is a bad thing. I think generally speaking, we are told all the time that we're to be fearless. I remember growing up in the 90s, the cool thing to do was wear a baggy shirt, like two sizes too big. They said no fear on it, right? Anybody ever wear one of those or just me? I, I don't know. I, Maybe never was cool, but I wore those shirts, all right? And so from a young age, I was taught no fear, be fearless. Fear is a bad thing. But the Bible doesn't say that the same way. It actually tells us that the fear of the Lord is a good thing. And so we then have to process, how could fear be a good thing? Why is this particular kind of fear, the fear of the Lord, why is it Good. Why do the people who fear the Lord in the book of Joshua get the Lord's favor? What is going on? Well, I think on the one hand, the fear of the Lord is a fear of negative consequences. Like you see practically for the people of Gibeon, they heard all that God had done to all the people who stood in uh, the way of God's plan, who rejected him and what he was doing. And those people just got destroyed. And so the the people of Gibeon, in a sense, fear that if they too stand against God, they'll experience that same sort of death and destruction. So on, on one hand, the fear of God is a fear of negative consequences. That's part of it. But that's not all of it. I think on the other hand, the fear of God is FOMO. It's the fear of missing out. You see the Gibeonites were a city full of great warriors. And they look at the people of Israel, uh, people who were not great warriors. They were not chosen for their strength or military prowess. And yet God has given them victory after victory after victory. And the people of Gibeon hear what's happening and they say, if we don't get on God's side... We will never know his power for us, his favor toward us, his mercy and grace in our direction. We will never know life with a God like that if we stand against him and get destroyed. And so the fear of God is both a fear of the negative consequences of trying to stand before an all-powerful God or stand against an all-powerful God, But the fear of God is also a fear of what life, of missing out on a life without him. A life without knowing his love and power and grace and favor toward you. It's fascinating that the fear of God did not drive drive the Gibeonites away from God. It drove them to him. And friends, I think the fear of the Lord still does that today. It draws people to God. Look at how that worked in the early church. Let me read to you from the book of Acts. It says, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, that's the same land that the the Israelites and the Gibeonites are in, um, in Joshua. The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So in the early church, there's this interesting dynamic where the people who walk in the fear of the Lord also get the comfort of the Spirit of the Lord. The people who walk in the fear of the all-powerful God who is sovereign enough to enact his will across this whole land as he had for centuries before this church uh, appeared or arrived on the scene, the people who walked in the fear of that all-powerful sovereign God also experienced the comfort of that God's all-powerful spirit. The people who feared him were filled with him. The people who feared him walked close to him. You see this dynamic at play. And as the people of the land saw that God at work and what that God was doing in his people, the church grew. It multiplied. People were drawn to God as God's people feared him. Do you see that? And friends, that's what we're praying for right here. 
The same sort of multiplication, the same sort of growth, the same sort of more and more people finding God. And so we wonder, what's that going to look like? I think it's going to look the same way it's always looked. The way it looked in Joshua, the way it looked in the early church. People hear of the great works of our mighty God. They respond in the fear of the Lord, and the church grows. We walk in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. This is how it's worked since Joshua's days. It's how it still works today. And so, friends, I think Joshua 9 gives us a new category. It shows us that God's people aren't those who come from the right place or have the best resume or the biggest bank account or the sharpest swords or the best strategies or the biggest army. God's people aren't those who come from the right place. They're those who fear and follow him. Amen? Anybody can do that. I want to highlight one more thing from Joshua 9 uh, as we close. It's this. A life of service is a high calling. All right, this is kind of tucked away in the chapter. If you read the chapter for yourself, I hope you do. It's not uh, long, so it won't take much time. You'll see that Joshua lets the Gibeonites live, but it is not a glamorous life. You remember in Deuteronomy, it said, whoever you make peace with shall do forced labor for you. Well, that's what happens to the Gibeonites. Here's what the Bible says. Joshua summoned the Gibeonites, and he said to them, why did you deceive us, saying we are very far from you, when you dwell among us. Now, therefore, you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. As part of the covenant, the Gibeonites struck with the people of Israel. They became servants in God's house. And I don't know about you, but when I read that at first, I think that's pretty harsh. That's unfair. If they turn to God, why would they be relegated to a life of service as servants? What is going on, God? Why would you do that? I think, far from being unfair, this is a life loaded with grace. I think a life of service is a high calling. See, God takes those who were furthest away from him And he stations them right in the middle of his house. Right in the place where they are most likely to hear of the great works that God has done. To see how God is on the move. To see how when the people made the sacrifices for their sins, God cleansed them. God took them from far off and put them right in the middle of the center of worship. Where they would be able to worship God as they served. Far from being unfair, I think this is loaded with grace. A life of service is a high calling. And that might challenge your categories. I understand. You're saying that being a servant is a high calling. I just don't know if I can buy that. Right? I, I get it might challenge your categories, but, but track with me. Maybe you feel like the Gibeonite. Maybe you feel like you've committed your life to following God, but it feels like most of your life is just unseen. It's insignificant. It feels like you're a woodcutter or a water drawer. You work hard. You give and give. You serve and serve for the benefit of the world around you, and it just doesn't seem to come back to you. Maybe you feel like the Gibeonites. Your life is a life of service, like parents. Maybe you feel like, man, all I ever do is keep my kids fed and help with homework and chauffeur them around or change diapers or do bath time. And I just when I feel like it's all done, I go to go to sleep to wake up and do it all over again. It's unseen, thankless work. Parents, remember, a life of service is a high calling. Medical workers, first responders, nurses, maybe you feel like the Gibeonites, like you go to work to serve people who will never remember your name or any of the hard work that you've done for them. You work a long shift to get home exhausted so that you can fall asleep and do the same thing all over again the next day. It's a life of service. Remember, that is a high calling. Adult 
children who are caring for your parents and you're making lots of hard visits and hard decisions and you're wondering, am I doing this right? I don't know how to care well for my parents. This is hard. Remember, a life of service is a high calling. Christian who's serving your neighbors and your friends, your co-workers, your family in all sorts of unseen and thankless ways. Remember, a life of service is a high calling. How do I know that? Why can I say that? Because, friends, it is the very calling that Jesus followed. Look at what the Word of God says. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, when you fear and follow God, a life of service is a Christ-like life. It's a life that is close to the person and work of God, to our Savior. Look, Jesus may never have been a woodcutter who brought in wood for the sacrifices of the temple like the Gibeonites did, But Jesus made a sacrifice on a wooden cross. Are you with me? Jesus may never have drawn water for the sacrifices offered in the temple like the Gibeonites did. But the sacrifice that he made on that wooden cross, when he was there, he poured out his blood. Jesus came not to be served, not to be served like a tyrant might demand. He came as a servant to make the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. Friends, Jesus made a way so that all who call on him can be saved. The blood he shed on that cross cleanses sinners from everything that stands between them and God. We no longer have to act with cunning and trickery like the Gibeonites did to find a loophole in the family of God because Jesus died on the cross to make a way for anyone who calls on his name. Jesus lived the life of a servant so that you and I can become part of the people of God whose life of service puts God's work on display for the glory of God and the good of the world around us. Amen? Amen. We have all kinds of reasons to celebrate who Jesus is and what he has done. Will you pray with me and let's do that together? Oh, awesome God. Your word is so loaded with goodness. And God, I just, I'm so grateful that we can read your word and we can know who you are, why you do what you do, how you've called us to be part of it. God, I thank you for this passage in Joshua 9 that shows us that the people of God are not just the people who come from the right place, they're the people who fear and follow you. God, as we just process that together as a church family this morning, I would ask, would you encourage your people today? If if we fear and follow you, if we know you as the all-powerful, cosmic creator God of all that was and is and is to come, the God who is sovereign, who's worthy to be feared, if we know you that way, and yet have found you to be gracious, And that fear has not led us away from you, but to you. God, would you encourage us today that we are your people? Would you give us that kind of humble confidence? That means following you isn't something that we do, wondering if we did it right, wondering if we're going to mess up and be kicked out. But no, we follow you knowing that you've invited us in. You've made a way. You want that. You long for that. You've designed us for that. God, encourage your people today. And for those of us who are sitting here who may never have known you that way, maybe we feel far off and like we've heard of what God has done and we feel that draw, that that crazy mixture of fear and follow happening in our hearts. We've just never taken that step. And if that's you this morning, can I just encourage you? Don't wait another moment, another day, another hour. Turn to God today. Follow him today, like the Gibeonites. Pursue that at all costs. God, I'm, I'm going to find you. I'm going to follow you today. This morning, that might look like a simple prayer. Pray. God, I, I know I've been far from you. I've heard of all that you've done. 
of all your love for me, of how you would call me to be part of your people, even though I've messed up so much, just as I am, you, you've called me. You're willing to forgive all my sin, to make me right with you now and forever. Give me all the blessings of life with you. God, I want that. Jesus died on the cross. His blood can cover a multitude of sins. It can cover mine. God, would you forgive me of my sins in Jesus' name? Friend, if you can pray a prayer like that, if you can commit your heart to that kind of following God, can I just say welcome to the family? God's encouraged. He's committed. You are one of his people. If you prayed a prayer like that this morning, I'd encourage you just uh, talk to a pastor, somebody sitting next to you, worship leader, uh, somebody you know, we would love to walk this life together with you. God, I thank you today. You don't relegate us to a life of service, something that you've never known. But you came to this earth to seek and save the lost, to serve the sinners who had no other way to know you or be made right with you. Jesus, thank you for giving your body, for shedding your blood, to make us right with God now and forever. Jesus, you deserve all of our uh, praise and all the glory that we can give. So we'll give it to you today and all of our days. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. I give you my life. I give you my trust, Jesus.